Welcome and thank you for coming to my TED talk. Wow, what a dream to say these words out loud. All right, so behind me you see a word, it's Koski. I will reveal the meaning later, but for now you'll have to have a little bit of patience. I'm going to put this here. No means no. We all know that, right? But does yes also mean yes? In a recent scandal, a certain football player was forcibly kissed by a certain football coach, and he then accused her of faking her lack of consent by looking at camera footage of her open and smiling body, which obviously meant that she wanted to be grabbed by the face and kissed on the mouth by her football coach, right? Obviously. No, so the, uh, the coach lost his battle and also his job, and his report was laughed off. Nonverbal cues and body language are not a good predictor for true intention, not in psychology, and apparently also not in the public or the authorities' eye this time. Instead of nonverbal cues and body language, we have adopted the enthusiastic verbal yes as the holy grail for sexual consent. But as a brain and cognition in society psychology master's student at the University of Amsterdam, wow, that's a whole mouthful, <laughs> I'm here to say that this is not enough either and that we need something new. Because what classifies as an enthusiastic yes? Tone of voice, prosody, melody? Do we need to take an AI into bed? Do we want an AI to argue on our bodily autonomy? I don't think so, right? It reminds me of a magic show I went to recently. A girl was publicly selected to come onto the stage. The magician then asked for her consent to touch her arms. And the whole crowd clapped proudly. How beautiful, right? Let me pause here for a moment. What do you think the girl said? You can say. Yes, yes exactly. But how can we know that this was a wholehearted yes and not one expected by the setting, the 500 people looking at her and the magician's hopeful look? Let's think of an even more complex situation. You and your partner have decided to spend some long-awaited quality time together. So you book a fancy hotel that sets the perfect romantic night for the two of you. After hours of build-up, dinner, candles, jacuzzi, suddenly, poof, your excitement drops, and you have zero motivation to continue. How on earth do you communicate that? Because as loving and understanding as your partner might be, yeah, you don't want them to think that you don't have like attraction towards them, you don't desire them. So instead, you just decide to just go with it. Or you do decide to say all of the above. Let me reenact that for a moment. No, baby, it's really not that I don't desire you. I, am re I really am attracted to you. And come back to me and tell me how that went. <laughs> the psychological phenomenon at play here is social compliance. We as humans like to do what is in the general line of social expectations. Because con cognitively, it's the path of least resistance. And by deviating from those expectations, you risk falling outside of the herd. Sexual, intended sexual assault granted, after hours of foreplay, it is physically hard to utter the word no, as you feel like you're deviating from a script of what a romantic night looks like. And this is especially like, we, by creating a fuss, you create that danger of falling outside of your herd. This is especially true for women and girls, as we are societally conditioned to have the nice girl syndrome, which means that we are rewarded for being nice, keeping quiet, not making a fuss, not being sensitive, dramatic, you know the drill. But this also counts for cis men and all other genders. It's not our fault that we don't like to deviate, it's just how we are built the pressure from the patriarchy and the roots of our psyche cause a barrier for us that we should break together. This is why we should 
make use of some of the key points within this problem of psychology and tackle exactly those with an antidote. What if we came up with a new word to stop a sexual situation without the fear of falling outside of your hurt, rejecting the other person or ruining the moment, as politically incorrect as that may sound? Because it is true that a lot of couples would prefer to let their partners finish, even though mentally they're already at the DHL station picking up their package. I'm looking at all of you guys. <laughs> I know you did it. Yet, this is hard to change, but with a word, if we spread it throughout the media and everyone knows of this word, you might lose that fear of falling outside of the herd, as by saying the word, you will be part of a new herd. Now, I don't need to remind you of the profound impact the hashtag MeToo movement has had on our society. It has been a catalyst for change. Language can be a powerful tool, and if we use it smartly, we can empower sexual safety and foster a culture of consent. Not only after the fact, such as with hashtag MeToo, but during as well. So, I propose Koski. And you might wonder, why Koski? What is so special about Koski? Well, I just did a little bit of research, and it turns out that French children really like when there's two of the same consonants in a word. The letter Z signifies the end of something, and the acoustic properties of the word shape the perception of the person that hears it. By this, I mean that the letter K is a stopping guttural sound. Just by this fact, it makes it better than the word no, as the word no is a continuous hum of vocal cords, like hmm instead of right? Koski could work. It's quite uh, like a catchy word. I want you to just try it with me. Let it marinate in your mouth. Can I hear it? No, I want it louder, louder. One, two, three. Koski. Yes, okay, that's pretty good. Okay, I like it. Now let's address the elephant in the room and let's get to the heart of the matter. When you say Koski, what will happen? How will your counterpart respond? Will they understand and respect your choice? Or will it spark a discussion? In case of a positive response, it might foster an even more intimate moment, one of true respect and understanding. And it might be even a cute, a funny moment for the two of you. Because let's be honest, saying Koski in the middle of a kiss is quite bizarre, right? So that's where the true power of this word lies and where the heart of the matter is. It creates a disruption in the moment and it classifies your partner as an in-group member or an out-group member. And I know that your partner is not your enemy, but I'm talking prehistoric psychology. So it's kind of like, are you on my team or not, you know? So in the case of a positive response, all is good and well. Then if you have an ambiguous response, that might be a good starting point for a valuable discussion. And in case of a negative response, you can refer to the Koski movement, and you won't feel as guilty for stopping the sexual situation, because it's now the other person who chose to make a fuss. So this is where the heart of the matter is. It doesn't put the responsibility on the person that wants to stop, but it shifts it away into the hands either of the other person or us as a collective. Because together we, it's the only way that we can change things and that we can reshape our culture. Because words are really a powerful tool to reshape culture, thought, and they reflect evol evolving values, norms, and beliefs. So let's have Koski as a catalyst for that change. And I just want to hear it one more time, but this time, like, really scream it at the top of your lungs, okay? I want to, like, a whole of Amsterdam want to hear it, okay? Okay, on the count of three. One, two, three! Thank you.